uh, on E10. Okay, the next category of drugs are antihypertensive drugs. We have said that atherosclerosis increases total peripheral resistance. It clogs up the arteries, raising vascular resistance. And that, that's believed to raise blood pressure. So that raises blood pressure. Now, why do we care? You'd say, okay, so what if blood pressure goes up higher than normal? Why do we care? So uh, this increase in blood pressure may burst blood vessels in our brain. It may burst little blood vessels in our eyes. It may burst little blood vessels in our kidneys. And it also uh, uh, increases the workload on the heart. It makes the, these vessels are all clogged up and there's a high pressure in them. It makes it that much harder for the heart to push blood through them. So high blood pressure is a bad thing. Uh, what are the contributing factors? Cholesterol levels, right? So uh, we've already reviewed that. Stress increases blood pressure. Smoking increases blood pressure. Hyperthyroidism increases blood pressure. And as we know, choose your parents wisely because some people do everything right, they eat right, they exercise right, and they still have high blood pressure. So there are genetic factors. So here at the bottom, we reminded you of what I just said. Uh, it, the high blood pressure can damage the heart, damage the kidney, damage the brain, damage the retina of the eye. Other than that, it's fine. Other than that, it's, it's not a problem whatsoever. Um, on E11, so the way they deal with high blood pressure is the doctors use what's called a stepped care regimen. And there's like four steps. So what's the first step? If somebody's got first identified as having high blood pressure, the doctors are going to try to get the patient to change their life. They're going to say, look, uh, you've got to reduce your salt. You've got to lose weight. You've got to start doing aerobic exercise. And you've got to chill. <laughs> all right? Because these are all factors that seem to increase or exacerbate high blood pressure. So if you know of anybody who's got high blood pressure, you know that they've been told to watch their salt intake. We'll explain all that. They've been told to lose weight. They've been told to do aerobic exercise and chill. All right? Most people just aren't going to change their life that way. All right? So they may say, the doctor will warn them. They'll say, your blood pressure, you know, come back in six months. We'll recheck your blood pressure. Six months later, everything's worse. And they'll say, have you been watching what you eat? Well, you know, yeah, you know, I don't want to. Uh, you've been exercising, well, you know, it's a big problem. Uh, you've been, uh, just stop smoking, well, you know, I'm thinking about it. All right, so in other words, it, it, for most people, it usually doesn't work. They have found that people who really do all these things, it really will lower blood pressure in most. Not everybody. Some people have genetic factors that even if they do everything right, they still have high blood pressure. But for the majority of people, this really will do it, do the job. But most people aren't going to change their life like that. So then the second step. The first thing they usually try is a diuretic, a water pill. Now they may choose, they, there's a kind of a, 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 a menu of options that the doctors may try depending upon their other problems, their other pathologies and other uh, underlying disorders. They might choose, instead of a diuretic, a beta blocker, an ACE inhibitor, a calcium channel blocker. But 80% of the patients, they can control mild to moderate high blood pressure using a thiazide diuretic. So that's going to solve it for most patients. But let's say that they tr uh, put the patient on a diuretic, and they still have high blood pressure. It didn't work. The diuretic wasn't sufficient then what they do in step three is they're going to give them two drugs, not just one, but two from that menu. So now they're going to combine a diuretic with a beta blocker. Now they might choose, they might combine a diuretic with a calcium channel blocker. It's a menu of options. 
but they're going to put them on two drugs. If one drug isn't sufficient, they're going to give them two. Now, what if the two drugs doesn't work? Still don't work. They still don't lower their blood pressure back into the normal range. Then they go to step four. Step four means they're going to put them on three drugs. So basically, until they get this high blood pressure into control, they keep increasing the number of medications they're on. And, then they'll, and they also start increasing, they use higher doses, and they use more potent or powerful drugs. So they, they really want to lower this blood pressure because this high blood pressure, as we saw in the previous page, can damage the brain, the eyes, uh, uh, the kidneys, uh, and uh, increase the uh, workload on the heart. So it's not a good thing because it's reducing somebody's lifespan. One of the first drugs, type of drugs, that they try to start patients on who have a high blood pressure, and it depends upon how high, but if it's kind of borderline or mild to moderate high blood pressure, they usually try them on a diuretic. And classically, the most common diuretics have been called these thiazide diuretics. Uh, there are many different subclasses of diuretics. And an example of a thiazide diuretic is hydrochlorothiazide. And it goes under uh, cute brand names. Again, I'm not asking you to remember names of drugs. Uh, this is cued HCTZ. Why do they call it HCTZ? For hydrochlorothiazide. Uh, it's also known as hydrodiarrheal. And diarrheal is kind of cute because the word to go to uh, urinate or pee is diuresis. So uh, and that's why they're called diuretics. Um, <clears throat> So uh, if somebody uh, is found, though, uh, when they check their blood pressure, that they don't just have borderline or mild or moderate high blood pressure, but severe high blood pressure, uh, then they're going to immediately they know they have to go more than just a diuretic. Um, the uh, thiazide diuretics uh, do cause you to pee. They're, people commonly call them water pills. Uh, they make people uh, urinate. And the idea is that they increase, they promote the excretion of water and salt out of the bloodstream. So we might ask, well, what's that going to do, uh, peeing out a bunch of water and salt? That lowers the blood volume. And lowering the blood volume lowers blood pressure. Now, first of all, let's make sure we understand that. Can everybody appreciate that if, you're, uh, if you cut yourself and blood's gushing out of your body, your, as your blood volume drops, your blood pressure drops. Does that intuitively make sense? So in this case, we're not having them bleed, but we are going to have them uh, pee out excess, excess water and salt, but that by lowering the blood volume, the blood pressure drops. Now, one of the other characteristics of having high, uh, high blood pressure is uh, the person tends to have uh, a lot of fluid retention and edema. That goes hand in hand with having uh, high blood pressure. So uh, we do need to, they do need to get rid of this excess water and salt. This is also why they want them to reduce their salt intake, because salt causes fluid retention. We've all heard this. Look, think about it this way. I won't get into the hormonal mechanisms. It actually involves a hormone called antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. But if you eat a whole bunch of salted peanuts, salted pistachios, salted popcorn, salted potato chips, it makes you thirsty. You start drinking water. So in other words, what happened? You ate salt, and that causes you to drink more water and retain that water. So uh, that by retain, eating less salt, you retain less water, and that should reduce uh, swelling, edema, and uh, blood volume. But anyhow, a second fat, uh, thing that diuretics, the thiazide diuretics do, is they also tend to cause some mild degree of vasodilation. So they cause some mild degree of vasodilation, and dilating blood vessels uh, has the effect of uh, lowering blood pressure. Uh, you might ask, was well, that going to trigger a reflex tachycardia? In this case, uh, I haven't seen that it usually does, it usually does not because uh, it's kind of a mild vasodilation, but that lowers the blood pressure a little bit. Anyhow, whether this is sufficient to uh, lower somebody's blood pressure or whether they have to go to a stronger medication or two medications, it really just depends upon uh, the results in the pa individual patient. There are a whole bunch of thiazide diuretics, uh, uh, one that uh, I'll mention a little bit more in a moment, spironolactone or adactone is sometimes known as a potassium sparing 
uh, diuretic. Uh, on page E12, on E12, uh, they have a whole bunch of um, combination products where they combine uh, thiazide diuretics with other diuretics. And uh, in terms of potassium supplements, what's all that about? The, we, the diuretic, we said, causes the patient to pee out a lot of water and salt. But it also causes them, at least some of these diuretics, causes them to also pee out a lot of potassium. And therefore, that, that's kind of we, something we don't want. And so they can develop low potassium. They can become potassium depleted or hypokalemic. And so therefore, they will either tell them, make sure you eat some bananas, which are a good source of potassium, or cranberry juice, or uh, almonds. Those are all good nutritional sources of potassium. Or they may just give them potassium supplements. So uh, that's just a side effect of some of these diuretics. <clears throat> um, other drugs that they use uh, to lower blood pressure are uh, adrenergic blockers. And uh, after all, we know that stress uh, activates sympathetic motor neurons, and that causes generalized vasoconstriction and increased cardiac output, and both of those raise blood pressure. Alpha blockers, if you remember, specifically block the adrenaline receptor sites on most blood vessels in the body, um, and thus block generalized vasoconstriction. So by default, the blood vessels all go into a dilated state, which lowers the blood pressure. So uh, they can use alpha blockers. Beta blockers uh, block most of the sympathetic response, uh, and including uh, uh, the uh, block uh, the adrenergic receptor sites on the heart, lowering cardiac output. And at higher doses, the beta blockers can be used to block the entire sympathetic response. So uh, those are used. On page E13, uh, calcium channel blockers. Remember what calcium channel blockers do. Mm -hmm. By reducing the influx, the flow of calcium ions into the heart cells, the heart slows down, lowering cardiac output. That'll lower blood pressure. And by reducing the flow of calcium into the visceral muscle cells in the walls of blood vessels, that causes generalized vasodilation, and that'll lower blood pressure. So calcium channel blockers uh, by causing generalized vasodilation. Generalized vasodilation will, will lower total peripheral resistance. Uh, calcium channel blockers will, lo will lower cardiac output. So if you lower total per, per resistance and you lower cardiac output, you should lower arterial blood pressure. Angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. Now, uh, these are a type of diuretic, and they are a newer category. And uh, before I really explain what this class of drugs does, let's take a look at page E30. E30. So in order for me to explain ACE inhibitors, which is what I'm really trying to explain, I just need to briefly remind you of something you probably learned about in physiology. And whether you did or didn't, I'll remind you in any case. Now, I'm not going to get into all the facets that I normally would cover in a physiology class. I'm not. Okay, here's what I'm going to say. Uh, whenever our blood pressure drops, normally, physiologically, there are cells in our kidney called juxtaglomerular cells, or JG cells, that release a hormone into the bloodstream called renin. It's easy, renin sounds like renal. Renin activates a protein circulating in our bloodstream that is produced by our liver. Our liver makes a whole bunch of different proteins that circulate in our bloodstream. Our liver makes the blood clotting proteins. It makes LDL and HDL, which transport cholesterol. It makes all kinds of proteins. So one of the proteins that our liver is always secreting into the bloodstream is called angiotensinogen. Renin activates that protein circulating in our blood called angiotensinogen and turns it into something called angiotensin 1. Now, this angiotensin 1 in our bloodstream 
is then converted by an enzyme in our lungs called angiotensin-converting enzyme, or ACE. Angiotensin-converting enzyme is an enzyme in our lungs that converts angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Now, I know that as I say that, you may be thinking, what does any of that mean? Uh, down here, below, you don't have to worry about it, but I'm just pointing it out. This is the amino acid sequence of this protein called angiotensinogen. Renin cleaves the last few amino acids off this protein, turning it into angiotensin 1. The angiotensin-converting enzyme, or ACE, cleaves or splits off a couple more enzymes, so now it's called angiotensin 2. So the point of all this is that this polypeptide, this protein is being altered as it changes from angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Anyhow, the important thing is there's an enzyme in the lungs that converts angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. What does angiotensin 2 do? Angiotensin 2 stimulates the adrenal cortex to secrete aldosterone which is a steroid hormone into the bloodstream. Now, aldosterone is a mineralocorticosteroid. A mineralocorticosteroid. I can write that down. A mineralocorticosteroid. It's a steroid hormone that affects mineral balance, sodium and potassium levels, among other things. So what does angiotensin do? Angiotensin 2 stimulates the adrenal gland, the outer adrenal cortex, to secrete a steroid hormone into the bloodstream called aldosterone. And incidentally, many steroid hormones have that ending own. Testosterone, progesterone, cortisone, uh, aldosterone. Aldosterone is a steroid hormone secreted into the bloodstream. What does it do? It stimulates the kidneys to retain salt and water and excrete potassium into the urine. So you notice that aldosterone is causing your kidneys to get rid of this mineral called potassium, so you don't have too much. And it's causing your kidneys to retain, to reabsorb and retain in the bloodstream salt and water. So it raises the sodium or salt level in our body. Uh, it, it gets rid of potassium from our body. And it causes uh, the, the kidneys to retain salt and water. Now, by retaining salt and water, that expands your blood volume. And by expanding your blood volume, that raises your blood pressure. Now, intuitively, in case you don't follow this, if you cut a blood vessel and blood was gushing out of, out of your blood vessel, blood is gushing out of your body, as the, your blood volume drops, what do you think intuitively is happening to your blood pressure? It's going down. So if a decreased blood volume lowers your blood pressure, then what do you think would happen if your blood volume keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger? Your blood pressure goes up. Does everybody follow that? It's got to be the reverse. If a drop in blood volume lowers your blood pressure, an expansion or increase in your blood volume raises your blood pressure. So that means that any time you're retaining a lot of salt and water, your blood pressure goes up. Now, physiologically, retaining salt and water and ex rate of expanding your blood volume, this is the way our body regulates our blood volume, and it also helps to maintain our blood pressure if our blood pressure goes down. Here's the problem. Some people's Renin angiotensin aldosterone <coughs> reflex is hyperactive. They are secreting too much aldosterone, and therefore they have what's called hyperaldosteronism, and they are retaining excessive amounts of salt and water, increasing their blood volume, raising their blood pressure. Incidentally, uh, th there are two major categories of high blood pressure. We have learned that atherosclerosis can lead to high blood pressure, did we not? Make, having our arteries all clogged up with crud raises the, it's as if the vessel's constricted, raising their blood pressure. 
This is called essential hypertension. But there's another type of high blood pressure. This is when we have too much of the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone going on, and that causes renal hypertension. Ever hear that term? Because renal hypertension is hypertension, high blood pressure, because of too, an overactive renal mechanism that with this renin, angiotensin, aldosterone mechanism. So they, they, they can reduce this renin, angiotensin, aldosterone mechanism. The first drugs they ever developed to reduce this renin, angiotensin, aldosterone mechanism, which is increasing salt and water retention and increasing blood volume and edema and blood pressure, the first drugs they developed were aldosterone blockers. Aldosterone blockers are drugs that block the aldosterone receptor sites on the kidney. And an example of an aldosterone blocker, which is still used today, is spironolactone. Goes under a brand name aldactone. So that'll reduce, that, that blocks the aldosterone receptor sites, which will reduce salt and water retention, which should reduce blood volume and edema and lower the blood pressure. Now, this is a, considered a diuretic because it's a diuretic because if you don't retain salt and water, that means you pee out salt and water. Does that make sense? Rather than retaining salt and water, you pee it out. Too much aldosterone causes you to retain it. Uh -huh. Is hyperaldosteronism synonymous with renal hypertension? Or yes. Okay. Yes, it is. Now, the next category of drugs they developed is they said, you know, instead of blocking the aldosterone receptor sites, why don't we block this mechanism higher up, closer to the beginning? So then they developed angiotensin II blockers. Angiotensin II blockers block the angiotensin II receptor sites on the adrenal gland, the adrenal cortex. An example of an angiotensin II blocker is a drug called COSAR. Anybody ever hear of COSAR? Mm -hmm. Now, I might just mention angiotensin II, not only does it stimulate the adrenal gland to secrete aldosterone, it also constricts blood vessels. That's why it's called angiotensin. Angio means vessel, tensin means it constricts the vessels, it raises, it raising the blood pressure. So by blocking angiotensin II receptors, it reduces the secretion of aldosterone, and reduces this vasoconstriction. The most recent group of drugs they've developed block this mechanism even earlier. They are called ACE inhibitors. They inhibit this enzyme in the lungs called angiotensin converting enzyme. They are called angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. That inhibits the conversion of angiotensin I into angiotensin II. An example of such a drug is lisinopril. Lisinopril. So lisinopril is an ACE inhibitor. Now, here's the, so here's the main point. You'd say, please, this is a mess. There are a number of drugs that reduce this renin angiotensin aldosterone reflex mechanism. And it's especially appropriate to give drugs that reduce this renin angiotensin aldosterone reflex mechanism if somebody has renal hypertension. But they will even reduce this mechanism even if the person has essential hypertension, because it's still going to reduce salt and water retention and lower their blood pressure. So there are three groups of drugs you'll, you, you'll run into. It's not that I'm asking you to memorize lots of drug names. I'm not asking you to appreciate when you run to look up such a drug, you'll have a better understanding of what the hell they're talking about. There are aldosterone blockers. There are angiotensin II blockers. And there are ACE inhibitors. All three of these classes are reducing the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone mechanism. And in so doing, they are reducing salt and water retention. Look, we know, you know that people who have high blood pressure, one of the things they're instructed to do is to reduce their salt intake. You know that. You've got relatives who have this issue. 
And if they can't lower that salt, and they can't reduce their blood volume and their swelling and the edema and the high blood pressure, they're going to put them on probably one of these three categories of uh, drugs that reduce this renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism that will cause their kidneys to excrete more salt than water rather than retaining it. So uh, <clears throat> let's, let's talk about uh, uh, these drugs. Let's go back to page E13. So on E13, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. What do they do? How do they work? They inhibit angiotensin-converting enzyme, which prevents the formation of angiotensin II, just as I've explained to you. By preventing angiotensin, so it, by uh, preventing the uh, formation of angiotensin II, that reduces vasoconstriction and lowers blood pressure. It also reduces the release of aldosterone, causing a reduction in salt and water retention, and that also lowers blood pressure. There's a weird kind of uh, side effect. I don't think it's necessary that you know this, but some of these ACE inhibitors can lead to uh, swelling of the tongue. But uh, I don't think I, I don't yeah, I don't think you have to worry about it. They can also lead to dysgeusia as side effects. There are a whole bunch of ACE inhibitors. As I mentioned, many of them have the ending uh, uh, IL at the end. Captopril, enalapril, that's the generic names, benzazapril, focinopril, lisinopril, monexapril, quinopril, ramipril, trandolapril, although the brand names don't necessarily end in IL. Some do. Um, <clears throat> all right, on, the, on page E14, E14, this is where they combine an ACE inhibitor like lisinopril with a thiazide diuretic. Uh, and then they have some where they combine uh, an ACE inhibitor such as uh, uh, some of these others with a calcium channel blocker. And in case you're wondering, well, why would they do that? Because we have said in the stepped regimen approach to controlling bl high blood pressure, they first start somebody on one drug, and if one drug isn't sufficient, they go to two drugs. So they may start them out with an ACE inhibitor, and if that's not sufficient, they'll add a calcium channel block. They keep adding stuff. <clears throat> Here's where they uh, have a, com a combination drug of an ACE inhibitor with a statin to lower cholesterol. All right, now they also have angiotensin II blockers, like COSAR. And uh, we had mentioned that they were actually developed before the newer ACE inhibitors. Uh, they block uh, the uh, uh, angiotensin II receptor sites uh, and therefore block angiotensin-induced vasoconstriction. And they block uh, the uh, angiotensin II receptor sites on the adrenal gland reducing aldosterone. And by reducing aldosterone, you reduce salt and water retention. Actually, all of the generic names end in sartan. I don't think it's, you have to know that because I'm not testing on drug names. But the COSAR is actually low sartan. Diovan. Many of you may have run into Diovan. It goes under a generic name, Valsartan. So these are uh, angiotensin II blockers. On page uh, E15, again, they have combination products. Uh, where they combine a uh, angiotensin II blocker with uh, some other drug. Okay, so far, I know that with learning drugs, believe me, I understand this, uh, you start to get them all mixed up. Uh, we've mentioned it hasn't been that complicated, though, as far as controlling high blood pressure. There are the thiazide diuretics. Those are the most standard. Uh, we've mentioned that they can use uh, adrenergic blockers. They can use uh, calcium channel blockers. They can use, ACE, uh, they can use drugs that interfere with the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism, including ACE inhibitors, angiotensin II blockers, and even aldosterone blockers. I'm just going to mention one more group of drugs uh, to control high blood pressure. There are direct acting vasodilators. Uh, again, I'm not asking you to know uh, names of drugs. There, this one I'm giving is hydralazine, goes under brand name Apresoline. 
and it directly dilates blood vessels. Anytime we have a drug that dilates blood vessels, that lowers total peripheral resistance and lowers blood pressure. Um, why I'm specifically mentioning this drug is for this reason right here. This is the drug of first choice for women with what's commonly called eclampsia or toxemia. Has anybody ever heard those terms, eclampsia or toxemia? Some women during pregnancy develop very high blood pressure. Now, some of you have already heard that some women, when they get pregnant, develop what's called gestational diabetes. You ever heard of that? Yeah. And it goes away after they're pregnant. But during pregnancy, they develop all the symptoms of being a diabetic. Uh, there are other women, could be the same women, who develop very high blood pressure. Because the hormonal changes occurring in women when they're pregnant include a lot of salt and water retention, increase in blood volume, and uh, swelling and all that. And some develop very high blood pressure to the point where some women actually have to stay bedridden the entire pregnancy. Maybe you've heard of such cases. So the problem is, uh, you're very, your hands are tied as far as which medications you can give a pregnant woman. Because we're always worried about the safety of the drugs to the uh, baby, to the fetus. So uh, when a woman does develop life-threatening high blood pressure, which is putting a strain on her heart and the other organs of her body, this is known as eclampsia or toxemia of pregnancy. This is the drug that is given for women who are pregnant, it is uh, hydrolysine. It's considered the least harmful, least toxic in terms of all the other, the others they generally will not give. They don't want to give most of those other drugs during pregnancy. Which is always this interesting question, you know, so somebody who uh, has uh, diabetes or has uh, high blood pressure, so does that mean they have to go off the medication during pregnancy? And depending upon what it is they're taking, they actually may have to stop taking their medication during pregnancy. Anyhow, uh, one uh, side little note, certainly you don't have to know it, they actually, a number of years, developed a, a drug similar to hydrolysine, a generalized vasodilator to lower blood pressure. And it had this weird side effect. It caused increased hair growth. Hmm. And they said, you know, our drug isn't selling that well as a, 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 a lo in lowering blood pressure, but maybe we could sell it to increase hair growth. And that's what Rogaine is. So if you've heard of Rogaine, its original name was Minoxidil, and it was used to lower blood pressure. But it had this weird side effect. So now they have Rogaine, you just rub on the scalp, and it causes hair growth. <laughs> so that's the origin of Rogaine. Uh, all right, I am not going to uh, deal with, uh, they have some much more powerful uh, drugs that are used to lower blood pressure. Uh, for moderate to severe hypertension, I'll mention one drug. There's something called clonidine. Again, I'm not asking you to know it. It goes under a brand name Catapress. It's also available as a skin patch uh, that they wear on their skin. It's considered a, quite a powerful medication to lower blood pressure. And that's usually given to people with moderate to severe hypertension. And when I say severe hypertension, what do I mean? Has anybody ever run into a patient with blood pressures like 180 over 120? Have you run into things like that? Yeah. And you kind of think, I must have taken it wrong. But there are people with really severely high blood pressure. And it's that you didn't take it wrong, you will run into patients like that. And they are commonly on medications like this, uh, Catapress. Um, there are a whole bunch of others. Let's summarize this, though, on page E16. So, in the management of the dental patient taking antihypertensive drugs, high blood pressure drugs, check for xerostomia, because a lot of these drugs cause dry mouth. A lot of all the drugs cause dry mouth. If the patient is on a calcium channel blocker, check for gingival enlargement. Ideally, one should check their blood pressure and heart rate uh, uh, before uh, dealing with the patient. Again, that's in an ideal world where you've got plenty of time. 
Uh, avoid using CNS depressants, which increase sedation, because it's not that you're giving these medications, but you know, dentists have to be aware of this, because a lot of these antihypertensive medications also have, they slow down electrical activity of the brain. And so you gotta be careful with other CNS depressants. And as you've all been trained, uh, you don't raise their chair quickly because they are prone to postural or orthostatic hypotension. You raise the chair gradually. You ask them to dangle their feet over onto the floor and gradually stand up because especially if they're elderly uh, and they're on these medications, they can collapse or faint right in front of you from postural hypotension. That's because They've, uh, they're on medications that are interfering with this normal uh, reflex that kicks in when we stand up. Normally, our cardiovascular reflex center, in response to standing up quickly, speeds up our heart rate and causes our blood vessels to constrict to maintain blood pressure and blood flow to our brain. But if they're on these medications that are interfering with speeding up of the heart rate, that are interfering with vasoconstriction, they don't show that reflex. So when they stand up quickly, their blood pressure drops to, and blood flow to their brain drops and they're prone to syncope or fainting. 